We come now to the fleet circuit from Lawrence Chung. In 1999, the magazine Everyday Practical Electronics published the Jewel Thief circuit of Mr. Z. Kapernik. That circuit has resulted in a massive amount of interest and a very large amount of further experimentation by people all around the world. The Jewel Thief circuit was intended to light a light emitting diode with the dead dry cell battery which had been discarded. The circuit is remarkably simple and very effective. The circuit is shown here. You have the dead battery and it's powering a ferrite ring which is wound with just 11 turns of two pairs or two wires in a pair side by side. The start of one wire is connected to the end of the other wire and connected to the plus of the battery. And the other wires go through a 1K resistor to the base th of a transistor and the other one goes directly to the collector of the transistor. The active component in the circuit is the ferrite ring or toroid. Normally only 11 turns of the pair of wires are used. When the circuit is powered up by connecting the dead battery, the initial, initial current pulse generates a higher voltage in the windings on the ferrite ring and starts the circuit oscillating. The oscillations produce short voltage peaks which are high enough to light the LED in spite of the fact that the battery voltage is far too low to light the LED directly. The circuit works well with the 1.5 volt battery which has only got 0.4 volts remaining in it. The toroid um, is wound with just 11 pairs of turns on it but the circuit has one mistake in it in that the output to the LED is taken from the collector of the transistor and that increases the current drawn from the battery because that feeds through from the battery through the windings directly to the output of the LED. The circuit was adapted by Bill Sherman so that it charged a battery as well as lighting the LED and that was done by adding just one diode and the diode then charges the battery while the LED is still being lit. Now Gadget Mall of the www.overunity.com web um, forum has taken the circuit further and found a very interesting situation. He has modified the circuit and used a bat cap which is very high capacity low loss capacitor instead of a battery being charged. The bat cap nowadays is probably called a supercapacitor and this one is 600 farads at 2.7 volts. Now the uh, addition that he has made to this circuit is he winds a second 22 turn coil on top of the toroid windings and he uses that to light a 1 watt LED from that winding. This is his circuit and it draws 13 milliamps of current from the battery for 14 hours. The battery is a 1.5 volt NICAD battery and the circuit is very straightforward. It is effectively a Jude Thief with a slight modification. The nichrome wire heater is disconnected at the time, at the present time, during the operation of the circuit. The exceptionally interesting thing about his circuit is that the bat cap gains so much power in that period that it can recharge the 1.5 volt NICAD battery, effectively making the circuit self-sustaining. Even after recharging the NICAD battery, there's substantial power left in the bat cap to do other things. The efficiency of this dual T circuit has been investigated by Jenna in her very interesting video series. These are the links to six of her videos. Lawrence Chung, along with a team of other people, has modified the dual T circuit so that it has a serious output. He assesses the circuit performance as being COP equals 10, that is, 
10 times more power coming out of the circuit than you have to put into the circuit to make it work. The toroid has been enlarged to a much greater diameter and ferrite has been replaced with just a plastic ring, say 170 millimeters diameter and 45 millimeters deep. This section of pipe is by far wound with two wires side by side. When the wiring has been completed all the way around the plastic ring, then the start of one wire is connected to the end of the other wire. Then the winding is covered with a layer of electrical tape to hold it in place and to provide an easy working surface for the next winding. The wire used for the winding is multi-strand figure of eight type wire. It's called figure of eight because if you cut off the wires the, and look at the ends, it looks like the number eight. The wire needs to be able to carry two and a half amps of current and it must be side by side wire and not one of the twisted varieties. It looks like this uh, when you see it. If you can't get the figure of eight wire with the two wires connected side by side as in this photograph, then it's okay to use two separate multi-strand wires and wind them carefully side by side. Having different colors to the wires is convenient. The second winding is made in the same way and the end of one wire is connected to the start of the second wire and for this winding that joint between the two wires is insulated as it's not connected to anything else. The coil might end up looking like this. The inner coil is connected as a dual teeth circuit and it oscillates continuously, causing an oscillating magnetic field to envelop the second winding. The really important thing about this arrangement is the fact that the amount of power coming out of the circuit is very much greater than the amount of power needed to make the circuit operate. Lawrence Chung describes the ector power as being led out of the environment and his theory for this is known as the lead out theory. Consequently, the circuit is called the FLEET device where FLEET stands for Forever Lead Out Existing Energy Transformer emphasizing that the extra energy has not been created but instead has just been drawn into the circuit from the environment where it already existed. The overall circuit looks like this. You have the plastic ring replacing the ferrite ring. The original wiring is exactly as before. The additional extra wiring is just on top of the first wiring and it goes through a diode to a load which is powered by the circuit. The physical layout, if you want to, you can do quite readily using just screw connectors that you can get from the local hardware shop. Now while the outer winding is shown here with thicker wire in a different colour, it's only that done like that to make the drawing easier to understand. In reality the outer winding is made with exactly the same wire as the inner winding and both of the windings go all of the way around the toroid. The total amount of wire needed to make the windings is about 70 meters and so it's normal to buy a 100 meter reel of the twin core wire as that is enough to make both windings and still have some over for other things. For technically minded people the output waveform from the circuit looks like this and as you can see it's a series of very sharp peaks separated in time. There are about 290,000 of those pulses in every single second. At an early stage I decided to confirm that free energy existed and so I built a fleet circuit in an evening. I decided to use two small 12 volt lead acid batteries for the test and I chose to use four diodes in a bridge rather than just a single diode. So this is the slightly revised circuit that I used for my test. Um, this is the physical layout with the four diodes connected in a bridge going to the load. The load in my case was another battery. I chose to use two batteries 
and stay away from any form of mains input so that it would be very clear that no conventional form of additional power could upset the results. So I used the fleet circuit powered by one battery to charge the second battery. Then I swapped the batteries over and used the second battery to charge the first. I did this a couple of times and then let the batteries rest so as to get a reliable reading from them. The result was a genuine gain of real usable power in both batteries. So I consider that result to show that free energy most is most definitely a fact, especially since lead-acid batteries waste 50% of all of the power that you feed into them when you're charging them. So my test had a circuit performance greater than COP equals 2. The efficiency of that test would probably have been very much higher if I had charged two or more batteries connected in series. The coil used was wound on a plastic pipe offcut, which was to hand at the time. It was 8 inches in diameter and 10 millimeters by 12 meters millimeters in cross section. And the wire that I used was single strand 6 amp capacity equipment wire, which was available at the time. These notes are downloadable under the name fleet.pdf.